Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to do the exercise 1C of the grounding part of the course answer set solving in practice. So here we have this logic program P and this set of facts I. Something important here is that we have a choice rule, but this is not something difficult to handle because choice rule will be grounded the same way as normal rules. The only thing is that if the body is simplified and we just have a head with a choice, then this will not contribute to the set of facts naturally, but it will only contribute the, those ground atoms in the head of the choice rule to the set of possible atoms. And, uh, well, if we look at here, we have this choice rule that allows us to... So here we have the definition of an edge and then some other atom just to make the problem more interesting, some other fact to make the problem more interesting. And the first rule allows us to choose, to select some vertex. And these two rules tell us whether for each edge, whether it's covered because one of the nodes that belong to the edge uh, have been selected. And the last integrity constraint eliminates the solution where there is some edge that is not covered. And this is an encoding of the, of the vertex cover problem. So intuitively, we have to select a set of vertexes such that every edge is covered and an edge is covered is some of the nodes of the edge are selected. Okay, so I have here written the logic program and the facts, and I have used these uh, shorter names for making things easier for us. So let's start with this. I'm going to call this rule R1, these are two, these are three, and these are four. Okay, and now the first thing we have to do is to uh, draw here the dependency graph of the program. So the first rule defines the atom of predicate Sx that appears in rule positively in rules 2 and 3. Then we can write here something like this with a plus to show that this is positive. And then rules 2 and 3 define the atoms of predicate C that appear negated in rule 4. Hence we have these dependencies there. Okay, now for the exercise, we have to to write down the, the dependency graph of the program, and this is just the graph that we have written, but without the labels. And we can write it in mathematical notation just like this. So the, the, the vertexes are the rules, and here we have the edges like R1 to R2 r1 to r3, and we also have r2 to r4, and r3 to r4. Good. And then, in, I think then I have to close it here, yes. And now, if you see here, the strongly connected components consist of a single rule, each one. So then, we can just find, uh, so a topological order of this graph could be, for example, R1, R2, R3, and R4. And here, and because basically R1 has to be before the others, but then we can choose whether we pick R2 or R3 first, and, and R4, of course, has to be the last one, right? Because all the others depend it depends on all the others. So then there would be another option where these two are in another order. Good, now let's do here this positive dependency graph, and this basically consists of this part of the graph here, right? Then we can paint it like this, and in more formal notation, we can see, okay, here we still have to write R4. There are no edges to it, but still R4 belongs to the to the graph. And then we only have those R1 to R2 and R1 to R3. Okay. Now, normally we use the positive dependency graph to separate to to for the following. So when we have here 
some component with more than one rule, we use this positive dependency graph to separate the elements of of this um, of this component. But here, every component has already a single rule, so there's nothing we should do about it for getting this LP. So we can get a one, a two, a three, and a four. Right, and again, we could choose the other topological order would change this a two and a three, but we are fine with this. And now the other thing that is left for us to do is to find the sets R, R, I for all, for the rules I. And then, um, and then for this, we have to see whether there is some, in the rules, there is some negative literal. And here, this is the unique negative literal. And we have to see whether for this negative literal, um, there is some rule that appears later in the order such that the atom C occurs in the head. And this doesn't happen because R4 is the last rule. In fact, um, so then we know that all the sets R are empty for, for all I that belongs to the set uh, 1, 2, 4. Okay. And uh, this we can also, uh, we could get to this result very easily just by looking at the program and realizing that there are no uh, cycles through negation. Or maybe just looking at, I think it's better now that we have built here the graphs, we just look here and we see that there are no loops that involve a negative edge. So then we know that, uh, that all the R's will be empty. So for some rule, the set R can be empty only if it belongs to, to some loop with a negative edge. It's not necessarily the case that if it belongs to such a loop, it must have some R, but it is a necessary condition for it not to be empty. Good. Okay, so now once we have uh, done these uh, first parts of the exercise, let's move to the next one. So I've cleaned this part now, and to continue, we only need to care about this order that we have and about the fact that all the values of R are, all the R sets are empty. Okay, so for we will ground them first R1. And here we have that initially the set of facts is I, and the set of possible atoms equals also I, this set of facts that we have here. Then for grounding this rule, we have to take into account all the possible values for this V. And here we have V of 1 to 4. So then let's start by doing this. S1, if B1, S2, if B2, S3, if B3, and S4, if B4. Okay, and now we can see um, how can we simplify this. So first, all these are facts that appear here. Then we can just simplify the rule like this, deleting them. And then we also have that S1 is a fact, right? So then actually it doesn't make sense that we ground this rule because we already know that S1 will belong to all the stable models. And then here we are left with these choice rules of uh, S2, 3, and 4. And now the difference with the... Now what happens is that we will know we know that S2 to 3 are possible and they will belong to the set D that we will write now here. But of course, given that they are choice rules and not facts, we are not going to add them to the set F. So now we have here that F equals I, but D equals I together with S2 to 4. Okay, and I'm writing it like this here. Now we're going to have to ground this rule, and then we have to find <coughs> the substitutions of the variables x and y, such that then the resulting atoms of predicate E and S are possible. So they belong to this set. So one way of doing it is first considering the ground instantiations of the of this atom that belong to our set of possible atoms. So basically we have to see, use just these values for the E. So then let's write it here. First, I write these values for the E atom because this makes it easier for me now to 
to continue to do it. And this was here I have s of x, so s will have the first argument. And then the head is just instead of e, we have a c here, right? Good, and then we can start simplifying. So these are facts. We have them here. Then we simplify it. And it's also the case that S1 is a fact because we have it there. So then it turns out that this leads to this fact. And um, here, what does we have? We have that S2 and 3 are possible. So we cannot do anything else to simplify there. And these two, they are not facts, so they stay there. Okay, then now when we come to grounding the third rule, we have that the facts are i together with c1, 2. And the d is i together with s, 2, 4. And together with all these things that now are possible, and even this is true, right? So I can just start here. c1, 2, c2, 3, and c3, 1. Right, so these are the atoms that are possible now. And again, we can do as before and just replace here by all possible values of the E. So we have, again, I'll write first the values of the E to make my life easier. And now in this case, the S has the second argument of the E. So I write them down here, and then same as before, if I have E of something, I will have C of something in the head. Good, and now I can start simplifying like before. This goes away because these are facts that I have there. And now, what else? So I have also S1, as before. You see here, S1 was giving me C12. So if I, yes, and here S1 gives me C of 3, 1. Okay, now S2 and S3 are possible. This is not a fact, but look, this is a fact. So then we are not going to have this ground rule because we don't need it. We already know that C12 is a fact. Then this gives us just this ground rule and this fact. So then when we come to ground, the last one, we have that now the facts are i together with c12 and c31. And then d is i, d is the same as before, right? Because here we had that all these were possible and the same happens here. So I can just copy it from what I've written there before. Okay, now I have to ground this, and I can do just like before, use the E here for grounding this, and I get then E1, 2, E2, 3, E, oops, E3, 1, and then I have, if I have E of something, I have not C of the same thing. Good, and now let's try to apply simplification. So this goes away because we have these facts. And then what else? So all the three are possible. We have them here, but in actually what happens is that C12 and C31 are facts. So then these two negative literals will never be satisfied, right? Because they can never be false. They will always, the atoms can never be false. They will always be true because we have the facts. Hence, we can get rid of the rules and this only gives us this single integrity constraint, not C23. And given that these are integrity constraints, they do not contribute uh, any facts or, or, or possible atoms. So then now I can just copy this here so that we know what uh, the, the, 
kvota de, de, de true and possible atoms in the end, right? So finally we have that C12 and C31 are facts and that these are the atoms that are, that are possible. And so if we recap what we have, let me then and zoom a bit. So we have the choices to select from two to four because we have the fact for one. And then we have um, the fact C12 from here and C31 from there. And now what's interesting to see is that at this point, when, when, when the grounder is grounding R2, it grounds the instance C31 if S3, and it's printed and it gives it to the solver. But then afterwards, when it is grounding this rule, it realized that C31 is a fact. So then the solver receives both this rule and this fact, but it will get rid of this fact, right? Because it will, it will real, sorry, it will get rid of this rule because it will realize that there's this fact. But just to know how the, the grounder works, the grounder will go one rule after the other. So it will give this to the solver even when in a way it shouldn't. But this is how it's working because it goes one rule after the other. And uh, yes, and also for you to 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 realize that what you are doing is correct, so you can see that in the end, so given that we have selected one, we know that this edge and this edge is covered, right? Because we have selected the node one that belongs to both edges. So then in the end, we only have to care about whether this edge is covered. And this is why in the end, we only have this integrity constraint that checks that the edge 2, 3 has to be covered. Good. So this was all for this exercise 1C. Then I hope you have enjoyed it and understood it. See you in another video. Ciao.